The Professors is brought to you by Blackboarder.com. The site features everything from pro player articles by Gerard Fabiano, Nico Boni, Joel Califel, Jan Massacard, podcasts, the Ask the Judge and Ask the Pro features, forums, a deck building tool, some of the lowest prices on the internet, and more. So go check out Blackboarder.com today. Based on the metagame pretense, why did you choose that deck? I didn't really care about the metagame pretense. Yeah, what about Worlds? <laughs> Aha! Welcome back to yet another episode of The Professors. This week I'm back from a 10th place finish at States. But while a 6-2 record bubbled out of the top 8, two guys from the local shop made it. So let's draw. Last week, I told you guys to play Jace Raider, and last Friday, I still believed that was the play. However, green-white aggro and black-white control had both been testing extremely well, so I sleeved up those and headed up Saturday morning. Checking out the field Saturday morning, Fog was clearly not the way to go. Jund was heavy with many sideboards dedicating 5-10 to 10 cards for their blue and white matchup. Boros Bushwhacker also showed up with all their stampeding 3-power, 1-mana creatures, so black-white began looking lesser in the field as well. Green-white became the right choice. Choice. Question is, for a constructed tournament like this, can you always do this? That is, thoroughly test two to three decks, take them all the day of, and scan the field to base the deck you run on that? Well, it's pretty expensive, but the only major expense for blue white, black white, and green white was Metaslayer Angel, so thankfully putting these, a Grixis Ascension list, a mono white aggro list, and a red green burn list the morning of between three people wasn't too costly, totaling roughly $40 between us. So tuning the sideboard then became the priority. But this is the main deck I'd been testing through the month. For the sideboard, the clear cuts were four Wall of Reverences, four Celestial Purges, two Luminarch Ascensions, and at least two Day of Judgments. All deal with Jund and Boros handily, and the Purges and Ascensions handle odd matchups. I still needed some way to properly deal with Planeswalkers and Fog, though, which is when the three Oblivion Rings came in. Turns out, these numbers are slightly off, and I should have tuned the deck to deal with larger sums of creatures and black removal. This is what the post states list looks like. Minus one Vines of Asswood, plus one Baneslayer Angel, minus one Kabira Crossroads, plus one Grey Pelt Refuge, minus two Oblivion Ring, plus one Day of Judgment, plus one Great Sable Stag. The Quad Angel Suite was not present due to money issues, but Vines never came close to the Angel's card advantage or beats and harm's way's versatility. The Grey Pelt is for a tad more fixing, though the life gain is disruptive for the Bushwhacker player, trying to calculate their next move to play around and the sideboard changes simply because there isn't that much non-red, non-black, non-creatures in the format, and those such as Elspeth can be dealt with easily. So the round by round was thus. 1-0 vs Valakut combo, 1-1 vs. Boros Bushwhacker, 0-1 vs. Naya, 1-0 vs. Mono Black Vampires, 2-0 vs. Bant, 1-0 vs. Mono Red. Missing top 8 by a couple of opponents' win percentage points, I ended in 10th. The most memorable card of the day was Harm's Way. No one expected it, and it wasn't just used to prevent lightning bolts or kill Knight of the Reliquaries. Throughout the day, it also saved two Dauntless Escorts from death by Caldaria Hellion, a 3-8 Wall of Reverence after being targeted with three lightning bolts and redirecting a 6-5 Mike Wood Shepherd's damage from a chump blocker to an opponent for the win. Do I recommend this deck in the future? Yes. However, you may want to tune it to the more expensive version that took down Virginia States. I mean, hey, it even has Thornling. Perhaps it's just a wanton trick on top of Metaslayer Angel and Knight of the Reliquary, but with Black Lotus Cobra, you can get the mana needed to make it unstoppable. I mean, with one green, you can make it have haste, give it trample, or make it indestructible. At that point, path is the only thing standing in your way, and the BGD theory is enough to eat those up. Take a look. As for actual numbers, Jun still appeared on top all over the states and provinces, but dozens of different archetypes showed the modularity of the format at times. Maybe even too much modularity. But let's see what these players thought. 
Nia lightsaber, and I took out one Bainslayer Angel, and I included one Great Sable stack. It's a good deck, and it has good consistent rhythm. I chose it because it was actually the deck that won Worlds. Inexpensive decks tend to be played more than expensive decks. Rixus, Pyromancer Ascension. I'm playing Dredge. Mama Bird Cascade, a deck that I designed uh, that basically consists of a bunch of Cascade spells. I hit targets like uh, Ronx, Warmonk, and Woolly Thoctar. It's very versatile. It's good against Jun because I can run Swerve and everything like that. If you want a consistent sideboard and you're not grabbing it from the internet in some way, you're going to need to go ahead and know the top eight decks in the format. Every card that you're playing, deck, field, sideboard, whatever, you should know exactly how they work. People are leaving man open and you should always be thinking, you know, what, what are they going to play? What can they play? I think you should be responsible to know what your card does. Like I made a play mistake today. I did Pyroclasm on the guy that had the Velcan and Outlanders, and uh, I forgot that they're pro-red. I think it does matter that you know what's in your opponent's deck and you know what's in your own deck as well. They kind of want the rules to be strictly enforced. Are you talking about uh, Papa Sorochas? I'm a little shocked. I mean, I'm surprised the judge did not catch because it's not a May ability. Well, if you know about something and you're just going to hide it like that, I think, you know, you should be disqualified for something like that. You know, cheating's cheating regardless. Ryan Gibbler versus Hypergenesis this moment is a I forgot to uh, vindicate something with his Angel Despair. That was on his opponent. Failure to maintain game state, unfortunately, is both sides. That's a little too extreme, just for like one person, but I guess, you know, you can't like have somebody on the side and just substitute them if someone gets disqualified. When people are playing decks consistently and throughout, they should know what's May and what's Must. It gets hard. There's many more Must abilities in the game Magic than May. If you don't know how to play your deck and you just pick it up and you attempt to play it, you deserve to be DQ'd. <laughs>
If that had been a lightning bolt or a blightning, this probably would have been game. Kevin blocks an elite vanguard with Bloodbird Elf. Here, I was pretty afraid Kevin was going to say Broodmay Dragon. Steve also plays another Ranger of Eos, which gives him a lot of hope. He decides to take two Goblin Guides, which is unfortunately guaranteeing that Kevin will draw into gas. Here, Kevin gets to a Siege Gang, but his life total's going down pretty quickly at this point. Steve decides to path to exile the Siege Gang. So Kevin chose to fire the Siege Gang at the Ranger of Eos. Kevin also gets two lands off the of Goblin Guides. Kevin plays a Bloodbraid Elf and cascades into Maelstrom Pulse. Steve plays his third Ranger of Eos this game. Steve searches for a Step Lynx and a Goblin Bushwhacker. The fact that he played a land last turn probably means he's got gas for the Step Lynx. And as he searched it up, it probably means he has plans to really fire off and win the game next turn. Steve attacks with Ranger of Eos. Kevin plays Bituminous Blast. Fortunately, he cascades into Terminate, which doesn't have any good targets. Steve also plays Step Lynx with Plated Geopede. Steve also plays a Lightning Bolt on the Blood Raid Elf. Arguably, this could have gone to the face. However, I do know that Steve wasn't holding a land at this point, so he was taking chances a little if he did take the damage. Steve pays two red and plays a kicked goblin bushwhacker. He then attacks for five. He passes it to Kevin, who just plays another Verdant Catacombs. Kevin draws into another land and plays it. He also plays a Broodmate Dragon. Steve is ready with two Path to Exiles. So until next time, this is Anthony Palmeria. Tap out for now. We'll wheel on tap soon.